My name is Evelyn, and I'm currently doing a PhD at the University of York, where I investigate team dynamics in digital game teams. Um, today, we'll be exploring what constitutes effective communication in real-world teams that operate in chaotic extreme environments, where there are severe consequences for poor teamwork. In my research, I am uh, generally interested in understanding how we can help teams work well together. And by work well, I mean how do we help them perform well as a team? Achieve out um, to achieve what they were set out to do, um, but how do we also simultaneously develop a pleasant, productive climate in the team? Within digital games, I am particularly interested in teams of strangers, um, and this is because playing with strangers is really common. And while playing with strangers is can be interesting and challenging, it can also be really frustrating. This is particularly evident in um, competitive team-based games. Player retention is also related to having more friends in a game, and so one of the overarching goals of my research is to try and figure out how we can facilitate in-game um, friendships or bonds to form between strangers despite um, their short-lived one-off interactions. So in the next 20 minutes or so, I'll try and get us to think about how we can design systems, uh, design communication systems that allow better teamwork between strangers. And my goal for today's talk really is to try and inspire new ways of thinking about how communication systems in the games are designed, um, the social interactions they afford, and its influence on play experience. Today we'll be looking at um, swift starting action teams, which as said in their name, they must start swiftly. Um, that means they have to perform well immediately and perform as they warm up. These teams usually do not have the chance to um, train together or develop together, and this is because these teams are usually formed of well-trained strangers with no or limited prior knowledge of each other. They also face high stakes from the beginning um, and include teams like emergency medical teams, uh, airline crews, and even some firefighting teams. These teams generally work in fast-paced environments under intense time pressure, and to perform well, they need to quickly and effectively communicate, coordinate, and make decisions. Now, these characteristics actually sound really familiar um, because we see them a lot in many team-based games, especially the competitive team-based games like CSGO, League of Legends, Overwatch, Rainbow Six Siege, and the like. But digital game teams are not entirely similar to society action teams. Um, the main difference is that the consequences of digital games are just not as severe. Um, digital games also have a fun aspect, while society action teams are purely performance-focused. Um, this is an important point to remember because it will kind of help you understand why certain communication behaviors were um, of focus in society action team training. Um, and finally, team-based games have different levels of time pressure, so they don't all face high time pressure. Um, this depends on the genre, of course. Um, but the main point here is that in both contexts, we see teams of strangers who have to come together for a short duration and have to perform immediately to achieve some goal before disbanding and probably never really seeing each other again or for a long period of time. So we're going to be looking at team communication today because it serves multiple functions. Um, communication helps a team to convey information to each other, to establish interpersonal relationships, um, and establish predictable behavior and expectations, which may be particularly important for virtual teams. Um, communication is also used to maintain attention to a task and to maintain situational awareness. So it was kind of the ver a really obvious way for which we could influence teamwork. In starting action teams, communication is really important. 70% um, of the first 28,000 reports made to NASA's aviation safety reporting system in 1981 were related to communication problems. Um, and this finding was really what sort of formed the basis of the direction of crew resource management, where they started to focus a lot of training on um, standardized communication processes or behaviors that help to um, ensure effective teamwork and to reduce um, errors. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is uh, similarly found in medical teams, where the root cause of nearly 70% of patient sentinel events, which are events that lead to patient death or severe physical or psychological damage to patients, um, is the result of communication failure. So a lot of um, communication training and procedures that is found in, an, in medical teams is actually modeled after um, the aviation industry. So from this, we can kind of learn that a team of experts does not make an expert team. And why I say that is because in all these teams, they are all composed of highly trained 
um, and highly skilled members, and yet they still face communication problems and, and teamwork, um, poor teamwork. So what does effective communication look like? What are the traits of effective communication for these teams? Um, there are two main communication behaviors that we see. Um, and the first is called closed loop communication, which is put simply the act of responding to commands. So in this graph on the right, we see that um, the first step is where a sender or someone makes a call out. And this call out is usually an instruction or uh, command. Um, and this callout may or may not be explicitly directed, um, given that the team is com composed of strangers. Team members may not be familiar enough with each other to know their names, so they may either call out the role or just you know, sort of put it out there for the team to, for whoever to respond to. Um, and then the person whose role the callout is referring to will respond by checking back to ensure that what has been heard is correct. Um, and then once they make this check back, the person who sent the first call out will then confirm that the check back was um, correct, confirm or verify it. Um, so an example here would be, maybe a doctor would say, apply two liters of oxygen via the nasal cannula. And the doctor wouldn't refer to anyone. But then the relevant nurse would then say, two liters oxygen via nasal cannula, uh, which is them checking back for what they've just heard. After which the doctor then says, yes, that's correct. And um, by communicating in this way, it ensures that um, information has been sent, specifically information related to a task, has been heard and understood. Um, if there is no confirmation in the form of closed-loop communication after a task has been assigned, it remains unclear if a specific task will be executed. Um, and this increases the possibility of missing an important action or um, losing valuable time during a crucial uh, process. So by using closed-loop communication, it will um, reduce misunderstandings, ambiguity, and errors. Um, and so it seems that closed communication is particularly important when teams need to um, make fast and accurate um, actions, uh, when they need to execute and allocate these critical actions quickly and effectively. So in games, for example, in Counter-Strike, it may look like the leader saying, storm the front, and then the fragger, who is the person who always goes in first, will then say, storming the front, to you know, check back that that is what's happening. And the support person will say, Roger, that also sort of checking back and acknowledging. So the close-up communication pattern doesn't always have to be a three-step thing. It could just be a two-step thing. It's just a sequence that, uh, it's, just, just, it's just this um, sequence of uh, responding to an information, specifically an instruction that's been sent out. So the communication loop has always been closed. Um, in this way, there's less ambiguity about um, whether an instruction is going to be followed up. Uh, which I guess for team games, it means that less people will, will die and get angry and blame their teammates for not following up. Um, the other communication practice that we see in Swiss Learning Action Teams is implicit communication, um, which is where team members voluntarily offer necessary information to their fellow teammates. Um, this is different to explicit communication, which involves offering information in response to a specific request. Um, Communicating in this way makes communication more efficient. Uh, it reduces communication overhead, which is the cost of sharing information. Um, it is the proportion of time spent communicating instead of getting things done. And when teams are able to implicitly communicate, it shows that they are able to anticipate uh, each other's needs. Unsurprisingly, implicit communication is most prevalent in high stress and high workload conditions because um, in fast business environments where teams are engaged in a complex task and under time pressure, um, they are under high workload. They need to spend their limited time and cognitive resources on completing the task at hand. Um, when team members communicate unnecessary information, this could use up attentional resources and distract from what's important, which can lead to poor coordination or for important things to be missed. So. Uh, in a study on Navy teams, they found that the difference between high-performing and low-performing Navy teams is that the high-performing teams would change their communication strategy to be more implicit during high workload con conditions. So in games, this might look like, you know, um, in League of Legends, for example, you would have Annie in the mid lane saying there's an enemy ward in this bush. A few seconds later, she may say um, the opponent mid laner has just used their flash. And then a few seconds la later, she may say, um, the opponent's jungler is in the top lane. Um, and by broadcasting this information without being asked for it, Annie is actually giving this necessary information to her, um, her fellow jungler so that the jungler can make a decision on whether to come and gank the lane. Um, and this is not just good for the jungler, it's also good for other members of the team 
because they then have an updated understanding of their shared environment. So how do closed-loop communication and implicit communication fit in together? Um, closed-loop communication seems to relate to instructions, ensuring that there are no misunderstandings and that every instruction has a response and has been followed up. Whereas implicit communication relates to, um, it's more about providing information about the environment and the task, and this allows the team to maintain situation awareness um, and also helps team members to coordinate and make better decisions, especially when like there's a lot going on. So how might this knowledge inform how we think about communication system design? Well, one way to do this is to, uh, one thing that comes to mind for me really is to think about whether the communication systems in your games already allow players to respond to information and commands. Um, and by communication system here, I am referring to um, systems that allow players to automatically send communication content. This can be pings or automated messages and even uh, e-notes. So do your systems allow players to give a response like yes or no or not yet whenever um, other players have uh, given an instruction and do they allow players to do this quickly and easily? Um, the other thing to note here is that sometimes actions and behaviors can be used to signal that an instruction has been heard. But I think that if this goes unnoticed by the sender, it can lead to a poor outcome. Um, in terms of implicit communication, I, th I feel like many games seem to have pretty good content when it comes to being able to broadcast information about the environment or about their needs. Um, this seems to be the first area of focus of communication systems when it comes to team play. So probably less of an issue there. The second thing that I thought about was adoptability. The next question really is like, how do we get, now that players have access to the communication content that allows them to carry out these behaviors, are players actually carrying out these behaviors? So how do we get them to do so? Um, so to encourage close-up communication, for example, maybe there could be prompts on the screen whenever a teammate gives an instruction. You know, kind of like uh, the recommended responses that platforms like LinkedIn have whenever you receive a message. So, for example, this is uh, League of Legends. Uh, maybe whenever a team member gives an instruction or makes a suggestion, um, like Drake now, that could be a recommended response that pops up on the side of the screen um, that encourages players to make a response. And maybe this recommended response would only disappear once a player has chosen a response. Um, and this way, it, it would reduce the ambiguity about whether other teammates are going to follow up on an instruction that was just broadcasted. Um, and, you know, if this seems to help teamwork, it may encourage players to then continue this behavior in the future, um, which could then spread through the rest of the community as a standard way of communicating. Um, but what about implicit communication? How can we encourage this kind of broadcasting behavior, um, but necessary broadcasting behavior? Um, I think this is something that probably comes as players gain more experience uh, and are exposed to different players and teams that use this communication behavior. In the literature, it shows that, um, or it suggests that implicit communication is a uh, byproduct of familiarity within the team. So you're better able to anticipate the needs of other team members when you actually know them better. So you need to have a work history together. Um, but perhaps we, we can actively encourage implicit communication behaviors by encouraging players to be more communicative in general and to use pain tools more frequently and more efficiently. So maybe one way is to make it obvious the communication differences between high performing and low performing teams. And perhaps one way to do this is to create a communication score that shows you know, how responsive someone is, how many call outs or, in, or um, information related to the environment a person generally makes, um, and how many commands and instructions does a, does a player send. Um, and maybe even rewarding players that, that communicate in this way. Um, and so that this can perhaps through the system encourage players to adopt this behavior. Um, these are just some of the things that I've thought about uh, in terms of how we can apply the lessons we learned from society action teams into the games, in the games today. Um, but I am not a designer and I'm not a developer. I am a researcher and would love to try and test these out with whoever is willing to collaborate. So, yeah, thinking about availability and adaptability. Um, 
But it's performance all we should care about. So all this time we've, we've been talking about performance, how to make things more effective, and all the communication behaviors and lessons have been about how we can make such adding action teams more effective. And by effective in that context, it's um, safer and uh, completion time, you know, quicker, more accurate, and this and that. But earlier, as I mentioned, um, I'm interested in both aspects of a team working well together, the performance aspect and the climate. So suiciding action teams are performance focused generally because of their time pressure and the critical nature of their tasks. Um, members of suiciding action teams don't typically have time to develop interpersonal relations. And this might be why we don't really see any training or interventions related to developing social relations between team members. But we know that in games, this is different. Um, people play to have fun. And we know that games support social connections between people. So really the other question is, what kind of communication behaviors or patterns or content help to develop a positive climate in a team? Um, for this, I'd like to share a few observations that I made during my user study of teams in Portal 2. So full disclaimer, Portal 2 does not have the same level of intensity or time pressure as competitive team-based games. But I chose Portal 2 because it's Portal 2, it's really fun. Uh, but well, because the goal of the game really is to get from point A to point B without distractions. And this makes it a lot easier, or it rather creates a more controlled environment for me to be able to investigate the effect of communication in teams of strangers. So for this study, I looked at 33 teams of strangers who were fully virtual, they were placed in different rooms, um, and they could only communicate using text chat and pings. And I chose this uh, setup because I wanted them to, or wanted to replicate the typical level of anonymity you would find in uh, many online um, team-based games. I then analyzed communication using Bell's interaction process analysis, which is a, um, a pre-established communication framework with um, four higher order categories and 12 subcategories for each higher order category. Um, the four categories are positive reactions and includes things like encouragement, laughter, and um, acceptance. Um, giving answers, which uh, you can think about it as giving directions, um, it's giving opinions, sharing your current experience. Um, the third category is asking questions, so um, asking for directions or instructions, asking for opinions, and asking for other people's experiences. Um, and the fourth category is negative reactions. This includes disagreeing, um, showing tension towards your teammate, and um, showing tension in general, like being frustrated at something. And what I found was that teams that communicated more via text chat um, generally performed worse. Uh, oh, I should say as well, I haven't actually analyzed the communication using pings. So really, this is only a partial picture of the communication in the team and what's going on. So take it all with like a pinch of salt. Um, but anyway, I also found that communication contributes to performance over and above um, the level of prior experience. This means that even if a team is made up of players who have had previous experience with Portal 2, communication still influences how well the team did. And this goes back to the whole um, thing about a team of experts does not make an expert team. Communication and teamwork is still really important. In terms of what the communication content was, we found that it was mostly um, the most frequent reason why people communicated was to give instructions um, and an analysis using uh, an, a, bleh, a word cloud analysis showed that the most common word was go. Um, so in this graph, we see that um, task related communication uh, specifically giving answers or giving instructions was remained the highest throughout the duration of the interaction on average. Um, but communication was also really positive and the most uh, freaking word was nice. And again, we see that this level, high level of positive communication um, maintained throughout the duration of the interaction. Interestingly, we also observed um, one of the teams ended up going for, for a sandwich after the experiment, even though they were complete strangers who were only communicating via text chat and pings. Um, and I guess the question is, you know, why or how did these strangers form a bond in their short interaction to the extent that they were willing to meet in real life? Um, and looking at their communication can give us some clues. So on the y-axis, we have the communication categories from Bales. On the x-axis, we have the duration of interaction in minutes, and the blue circle and the orange cross represent the two players on the team. 
So we can see here that there was um, a lot, well, there was frequent non-task non related chat. Uh, this is indicated by the frequency of communication code 13. So they were usually talking about other things outside of the immediate task or puzzle solving activity. Um, there was also a lot of friendliness and encouragement and jokes and laughter. And this can be seen by the frequency of communication codes one and two. Um, so there's a lot of ha ha ha's, a lot of nice, a lot of way to go, great teamwork, things like that. Um, and in general, we can see that both players were communicative as we see um, the blue dot and the orange uh, cross uh, always quite close together. So there was a lot of reciprocal back and forth communication. So we can think about, you know, again, content and behavior. How is, it is this kind of content available? And how do we get players to adopt this behavior? Um, for this, I think Dota 2 has actually done really well in this respect. Um, for one, they allow players to customize their chat wheel, not just in terms of the choice of automated text, but you can also include emojis. And I think this is kind of helpful to convey emotions and, you know, some to some extent, lighten the mood, you know, keep things light. Uh, because I guess emojis can't ever really be taken sort of seriously or, or create a serious mood. Um, and in many games, there are emotes that serve a similar function. Um, but Dota 2 also includes phrases that contribute to the climate of the team. In addition to the, the typical stuff, they also have things like, sorry, don't give up, my bad, relax, you're doing fine, and whoops. Um, which I think are, I haven't really seen this in any other game. To be fair, I don't play that many games, but, but I was really impressed when I realized that Dota has this. Um, I'm not sure how Valve decided on these phrases, but I suspect that developers can uncover what are the frequent phrases or terms that players use that contribute to building a positive team climate by analyzing the text communication or even voice chat between team members. So I hope I've been able to help us think a little bit more about how we can design communication systems that allow better teamwork between strangers and better teamwork here, again, is performance and climate. Um, I want to close by just summarizing that a team of experts does not make an expert team, so we should find ways to guide players toward effective communication behaviors in order to improve teamwork between strangers. So that's me. Thank you very much for listening and catch you on the internet. Thank you.